A showreel is just one piece of branding, it's one asset. Um, branding is, you know, as we said before, it's, it's the whole experience. It's everything from start to finish. Hi, I'm Julian Wakefield. I am a co-founder of Terralon Media, and uh, today we're going to talk about how to brand yourself as a filmmaker. Here at Terralon, content is pretty much central to everything we do. So photography, filmmaking, animation, all that kind of stuff. But we also help our clients with all the strategy around it because there's no point in filming something that no one's going to want to watch or filming something that delivers the wrong message. I want to talk about the importance of creating your, your brand as a filmmaker. And for me, there are two reasons why you really want to establish your brand. The first is so that your potential clients can really make sense of who you are. And they, if they understand who you are, then it's easier for them to hire you. Uh, they're not sitting there wondering how you would fit into their narrative and how you can help them. The second is to establish trust. Brands that you and I know um, and use every day a large part of why we would use them is because we know what to expect from them. Um, so the importance of consistency is, is going to be very central to what I'm going to be talking about. What is branding actually? It's, n it's not just logos, it's not just your visual identity, it's, it, that's not a brand. I'd say it, it's what other people say about you when you're not in the room. If two of your friends were talking about you, what do they say about you when you're not there? That's what your brand is. Not just your logo, not just your tagline, it's so much more. It's the whole experience of what work do you deliver, what it's like working with you. It's everything from sales to the products that you deliver through to customer service. All of that is part of a feeling that, that your clients or potential clients will have when interacting with you or when thinking about you. So. For sales, that's really important because you want them to trust you, because if they don't trust you, then there's no way they're ever going to hire you. For the experience of creating content with you, that's very important because you want people to recommend you afterwards to other people. Now, who do you want to be as a filmmaker? Do you want to be someone who makes quick, fun, affordable social media videos? Or do you want to be someone who makes a high-end marketing campaign, TV ads? That kind of comes down to positioning, positioning yourself in the market. So think of airlines, for example. You've got EasyJet, uh, cheap and cheerful, affordable. You don't expect like high luxury from them. And then you have first class British Airways. That's more of the high end of the market. The similar questions come around whether you want to be a specialist or a generalist. Generalist meaning that you make all sorts of different videos, everything from wedding videos to corporate videos to commercials. Whereas a specialist, you could be a drone operator, for example, and only do drone videos. My opinion is that it's much better to be a specialist because it's easier for people to understand who you are, what services you deliver. Who do you think that the potential client is going to go for? Someone who says, I do wedding videos or I do a bit of everything. If, they're, if, they're, if they want a wedding films, then they're going to go for the guy who says I do wedding videos. So for me, picking a niche is quite important and, and I would, if I had to choose between being a specialist and a generalist, I would definitely choose uh, specializing in a certain type of filmmaking. So how do you find your niche? Um, it's important to pick a niche or pick a service that you want to deliver that, that kind of matches who you are, what your personality is, you, you want to be authentic. You also want it to match your skills because you don't want to be doing something that you're not good at. You also want it to fit nicely in the market because you want to pick something that will actually make you money. In order to find all of those things, that's, that's not necessarily gonna, gonna come to you like all at once. Which is why at first, if you're starting out, it's, it's not a bad thing to be a generalist and to do a bit of everything. I mean, I've done a lot of different things and even now, sometimes I experiment with, with different types of filmmaking or 
different industries for our customers that we want to target. But um, in terms of building your brand, I'd say starting out, do a bit of everything, experiment, find what you like doing, find what you're good at. Then once you've found something, that's when you can really start building your brand because at first you'll kind of be prototyping, you'll be searching what you want to do. Then once your prototyping is done, you have something concrete that you can build on. We were very deliberate in branding Terralon as a company under the Terralon name and not my co-founder uh, and my name as freelancers. Big part of that is because we knew that as freelancers, you're known un under your own name and people will want you as a, as a person. And if you're, you know, say they want to book you for a day and you're busy that day, you have to say, no, I'm sorry, I'm busy. As a company, you can say, yep, yeah, okay, no problem. We have a camera operator that we can send out and, and they can help you out with that. So not only is it more scalable, I feel like companies can take on larger projects than, than uh, freelancers can. And we always had that appetite for larger projects. So now that you've kind of built your narrative and developed what you want your brand to be, you need to be consistent in how you act. So not only consistency across every aspect of how you work and what you deliver, but also consistency in time. And consistency in business and in sales is one of the most important things. When we hire freelancers, providing they're not terrible, I would much rather have someone who is uh, consistent and a little less good at their camera work than someone who is inconsistent but really good at their camera work. So to give you an example, if I need to send someone out to go and film a video on our behalf, uh, with our clients. If they are consistently late, like they're exactly half an hour late every single time, that's easy for me to deal with because all I have to do is tell them to be there half an hour before they have actually have to be there. So they'll be on time and I can work with that. But if they are mostly on time, sometimes late, sometimes early, that becomes a problem. That also goes for the level of quality of your work and, and what you want to deliver to clients. So uh, another example in, that's relevant to filmmaking is think about how you deliver your videos. Do you send people a link in an email when you want to deliver it? Do you send them a, a download link? Do you send them a link to a WeTransfer download? Do you send them a link to a Vimeo download? make sure you're consistent because if you're like if, if you're one day sending them a Vimeo link and then the next day you're sending them a WeTransfer link and then the next day you're sending them a I don't know a USB thing through the post it, it kind of comes across as if you're disorganized but if you have a client with whom you work on a regular basis and every single time they know what to expect they know to expect a Dropbox link or they know to expect whatever it is be consistent and the way to do that is when you are working out your brand, figure out how you want to deliver your content. That's, that's part of your brand as well. I, I see a lot of wedding filmmakers who, to go back to that example again, they deliver their uh, final edits on a really nice USB key, uh, maybe engraved with the couple's name and the date. Um, and then they put that in a nice little wooden box with a ribbon around it or something and then and they deliver it that way. So high-end versus low-end, like w when I say that, I mean high-end are a larger filmmaking crew. So the projects that you, you typically will have a separate director and, and director of photography and, and uh, producer um, and maybe a few camera assistants and focus puller or whatever. The kind of projects that you will storyboard for and do a, a recce for. Whereas low end, I suppose low end is not a, not a very good term to use because it's rather unflattering, but I mean more like independent filmmakers who go in as a one man band or possibly with, with one assistant. And that's an art form in itself because if you are there on your own and have to make some, have to make 
maybe an uninteresting office in central London if you have to make that look good. If all you have is yourself, maybe a few lights and an assistant, that's very difficult. Whereas if you are part of a much bigger team and, and it's a project with a higher budget, then you know, it's way easier. You can bring in props or you can rearrange their furniture or you can say, hey, we need a plant in here. We'll bring that on shoot day. I'd say maybe, maybe using high end versus low end is a bit, a bit clumsy because it's, it's not like, you know, one is not better than the other, it's just different. Business wise, it, it's one is not better than the other either because if you're running a business where you just have two employees, one camera operator and one camera assistant, especially if you are one of those two employees, you don't have as much overhead or you don't have as many costs as having to pay a huge team. So you could even make more money by doing the sort of indie filmmaker type stuff than the larger projects. When you pick your clients, you'll want to consider who they are. So a good, good example is, do you want to work for the end client or do you want to work for a production company who's kind of in between you and the end client? If you want to work for the end client, you're going to want to focus a lot more on reassuring them, educating them about the process, and you'll use very different language to the language that you'll use when talking to a production company. A production company might care a lot more, for example, about what cameras you're used to working with, whereas an end client won't even, in most cases, won't even know the different types of cameras that are available. I see a lot of people who want to work with the end client who keep posting behind the scenes pictures of their camera setups. I don't think that's a very good idea. It, it has its strengths in that if you show large camera setups, it looks impressive and, and the end client might think, okay, like, yeah, he's, he knows how to use a big camera. Um, and we might get HD video. And if you mention 4K, they're kind of like, what's that? If you're working for an end client, they're far more interested in seeing the end result. Um, so talking to our current clients, a lot of them say that a big thing that helps them decide whether or not they want to hire us or you or whoever is whether or not they have work that is similar to what they're looking for. So if you want to post pictures of your cameras on social media, then do it in the context of this is what we produced and this is how we do it. And this is how we do it is, what, is the way you show your cameras. But show what you're making. To choose your clients, the way we do it is we tend to stick to clients who are in an industry in which we have already produced some work because it's much easier to convince a client by saying, hey, look what we've done, you could use something exactly like this. Or if they're looking for something like that, it's easier than if you, you have to say, I could do this for you, I haven't done anything similar in the past, but trust me, even though you know you're perfectly capable and it might be easier to produce than some of the other things you've done in the past, they won't necessarily know that. I suppose that comes back to what we were saying earlier about a niche. If you've done a lot of work in a specific niche, it's a lot easier to persuade clients to hire you because you have loads of very relevant content to show them. Second thing we use to find or to pick clients is do they need our services? Because if you look at their social media channels and if you look at their website and they're doing things perfectly and they're getting a lot of success, then it's a bit of a lost cause. You're going to waste your time trying to, trying to sell them your services or trying to sell them something that they already have. And then finally, you also want to pick clients who have the budget that match your ambitions. Because if you want to do all these large productions, then maybe pick a client that has the budget to finance a large production like that. If you want to do a bit more casual indie filmmaker type stuff, then it's a bit easier. Um, there are more people who will be able to afford you. For me, if I see someone's showreel, I'm like, okay, yeah, cool. Like he's taken like a shot from, you know, the one good shot from this video and then the one good shot from this video and the one good, it's very easy to make a showreel that looks cool. And if anything, that kind of shows me editing skills rather than anything else. I would much rather see a case study, for example. And that's what we do on our website. We, have, we do have a, a showreel 
it's not just a show really, it's sort of like the first three quarters of it is us talking to the camera, explaining to people who we are, and then there's like a 30 second mini show reel at the end. What we do to show off our work is, is case studies on, on, on the work page where we show the end product. We give a short explanation of what the client's needs were, what the challenge was for us, and what we delivered to the client then maybe a few stats on how well the content that we made for them performed um, and then underneath any photos or behind the scenes photos that, that go along with it. I think that gives you a much better overview um, than a showreel which is just a compilation of shots. A showreel doesn't really give you an understanding of who this person is or who you are and how you work. If you turned up late to each of those projects and if Though each of those videos are the one video that you've done for each of those clients, even if the shot looks good, but the client hated working with you, like a showreel doesn't show that. A showreel won't show how punctual you are, how good of a communicator you are, um, and that's kind of part of part of branding. A, a showreel is just one piece of branding. It's one asset. Um, branding is, you know, as we said before, it's is the whole experience. It's everything from start to finish. And if you have a one minute video on the, um, on the homepage of your website, okay, a showreel will do the job if you don't have time to make something better, but I'd rather see you talking to camera, kind of presenting yourself in a creative way because you're creative and, and you make creative videos. And then maybe a little bit, little showreel at the end, which is what we've done on our website. So, you know, if, you, if you're curious, feel free to, um, head over there. I'm sure there'll be a link somewhere here or here or here or in the description, whatever. To figure out how to present yourself to your potential customers, first you need to do all the work that we've previously spoken about. So you need to pick your niche or not necessarily your niche just yet, but you know, pick at least who you want to work for and what kind of work you want to do. Once you've picked who you want to work for, all you have to do is reverse engineer from there. If you're wanting to work for other production companies, you're going to be on probably Instagram. You're going to want to have your website as your kind of shop front window. If you're a graphic designer, you'll want to be on places like Behance or Dribbble or other places like that. If you want to work with end clients and you're more of a, a, a B2B offering, you'll be on LinkedIn. If you want to make wedding films, then Pinterest is often a, a good place to be. Um, although I think for things like that, maybe recommendations is uh, from, from other friends and family are, are, are a good thing. So you could uh, figure out a way to leverage that um, potentially by offering discounts uh, to people who might refer a friend. So once you've figured out the platforms on which you will be promoting yourself to your potential clients, you want to make it very clear in how you fit in with their narrative. To do this, identify what their need is and make it very explicit in how you will respond to their needs. For example, you could say, we make promotional content that will make your brand stand out. Um, their need is to make their brand stand out. You fit into that by making promotional content to make their brand stand out. If you said beautiful videos, they're like, okay, cool, make beautiful videos, but then you're leaving it up to them to connect the dots that your video will make their brand stand out. It's all about making the decision to hire you as easy as possible and removing any friction. Now that friction may be because they don't trust you, it may be because you are charging too much, but also if you're charging too little, you'll add friction on the trust level because if you're charging too little, then it's like, is he not good enough? So yeah, I mean, that's, that's all of that is why you want to uh, put in the work in deciding who you want to work for and what your brand is and, and what price point you should get in the market at. And if that's consistent, then People will trust you and people will hire you. So branding is 
building a narrative around you and your services. And I'm going to go back to Donald Miller and, and his book, Building a Story Brand. He says that it's very, and I agree with this, he says it's very important to frame the story, not with you as the hero of the story, but your client or potential client as the hero of the story. And you're a guide to help them in their journey. So if you, if you brand yourself as the hero of the story, um, you're only going to create conflict and rivalry between your client because your client is the hero of their own story. And if they see you and your messaging and think, wait, hang on, like, there can, there's only room for one, one special guy here and like, that's me. Why is this other person trying to steal the spotlight from me? So you need to come in um, as a person that's going to help them achieve what they want. Say, for example, to use the metaphor of say trying to cross a forest, you, your client is the one who needs to get to the other side of the, this forest. You're there at the entrance of the forest as a guide. You're not there as another hero also trying to cross the forest because otherwise it's like, well, we're trying to do the same thing. Are we competitors? I don't know. Maybe we can team up. Fine. But if you're there as someone who say, hey, like I'm here, I'm, I know how to get you to the other side of this forest, they'll trust you and they'll, it'll make the decision to hire you easier. Um, now to take the metaphor even further, if you come along with a well-built narrative saying, I've done this before, I know a path through the forest, I know how to get there, uh, look at this map that I have um, uh, drawn up and this is the path that we're going to take. That map is things like your past work on your website. It's things that you can like show them and prove to them that you know how to help them get to where they want. Don't come in as if you're both a hero of the story because otherwise you're just like both two people trying to get to the other side of this forest. You want to be a guide, you want to be someone who can help them help them cross that, that forest. They're, they're like sidekick. So how do you put a price on your services? How do you figure out your day rate? What we've done, because we want to be seen as slightly premium, right? We're not the EasyJet or the Ryanair of filmmaking. We have taken the industry standard rate and priced ourselves slightly higher. Now what's very important if you do this, you have to be able to back that up with the service to match and the, the product that to match. Um, we're able to do that because we provide a good service to our clients. They're paying extra because they want to know that they're in good hands and that we're reliable, that they can trust us. And to a lot of people that's worth a lot of money because otherwise you're left with the stress of like, I've paid for the cheap option, are they going to deliver something good or is it going to be chaos. But if, if you are going to price yourself higher, your clients will expect more of you. So you can't just price yourself higher than all the competition and do exactly the same. Pricing yourself higher is great because it makes you stand out. It, it's a very, you know, why are these guys twice as much or three times as much, whatever it is, whatever you decide to price yourself at. That will all already make you stand out, but they will expect more from you and you do need to deliver. Otherwise, you'll just face the nightmare of having a lot of complaints. Like they'll expect premium service and if you deliver a regular or subpar service, then that kind of won't match. To kind of explain some of the theory behind why charging more might get you more work, imagine if you're not a filmmaker, you're, you're client side, so you're working for whatever company, and your boss comes to you and says, hire a filmmaking team. We want to promote this event, or we, we want a team of filmmakers to cover this really important event that we're hosting. So you go out and do your research, and you find two options. You find one option which is slightly cheaper, seems like good content, uh, good quality of, of, of results and films that they produce. And then you find someone who's a bit more expensive or even a lot more expensive. But the quality kind of seems 
similar. They, it may even be slightly, slightly worse. Um, one is more expensive, one is cheapest. If you hire the cheaper one and they mess it up and all of a sudden your boss comes to you and says, what happened? Why do we not have a video of our event? It's all for nothing or whatever. You're then left having to justify, oh, I tried to save a couple hundred pounds or dollars or whatever. And that backfired and you're, you know, pardon my French, but you're in the shit. Whereas if the more expensive option, if, if they messed up, your boss comes to you and says, oh, what happened? Why, why, is there, why is the video not here or something? You can then turn around and just say, well, I don't understand either. I hired the, you know, the best in the business. I hired these guys, they were the, the premium option. So all of a sudden, as a client, you don't have that responsibility anymore. The responsibility is on the production company. That kind of, that, that's one way to explain why charging more kind of reassures people on client side because it makes you seem more premium. Um, it makes it easier for them to make the decision of hiring you. Uh, it makes them trust you more. The way you're going to stand out, there's the expensive way of doing it is, you know, make a little promotional video and pay for sponsored ads on Facebook or LinkedIn or, you know, pay to be on the uh, um, pay-per-click campaigns on, on Google. But if you don't have those kind of budgets yet, <laughs> treat your, your $1,000 or £1,000 projects as if they were £15,000 projects. Put in the effort. If, if you're starting out, you'll have, and, and if you don't have that many clients, at least you'll have a lot of time. So use that time to really make your current clients feel special and they will almost market you for you. They'll recommend you. Um, if you're really good at this, they will almost want to recommend you. They'll feel excited about recommending you because if you have given them an enjoyable experience in working with you and they are able to recommend you to someone else and enable someone else to have that enjoyable experience with you as well, it makes them look good because they know this guy uh, who is really good at filmmaking. Don't repeat what everyone else is doing. You need to find your own brand, your own personality, your own offering, otherwise you just won't stand out. Don't focus on gear. Uh, gear is very important and I think Saying that gear is not important is, is a mistake because you do need the gear to carry out the work. But don't focus on it, it's just a tool to get the job done. Uh, you want to focus on the end result and then figure out what gear, what is the minimum amount of gear that you need to achieve that end result and get that and that's it. We work a lot with larger setups and larger cameras and we have sometimes rented Reds or Alexas or whatever. Um, and all the fancy lenses, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the best work that we've done. Uh, and it doesn't, from a business perspective, that doesn't necessarily mean that those are the jobs that will bring in the most cash. Um, we spoke about earlier, having a lot of overheads will reduce your profit. So if, you're, if you've got a huge rent, uh, gear rental bill for a project, and the end client doesn't care what camera you're filming on, film on a camera that will be good enough. Don't be inconsistent, or rather be consistent. Consistency is key because branding is a marathon and not a sprint. It will take time to develop your brand. Um, it will take time to earn people's trust. It's not a surprise that if you see an ad for a product, you won't immediately want to jump on and buy that product. But if you've seen five or six ads for that product, you are more likely to want to purchase that product because they've been consistent in that they've reached you several times and you've been exposed to their message several times. So you're more inclined to trust them because they seem more established. 
uh, not only because they're able to, I don't know, pay for that many ads, but you trust them, they seem more present. Don't try and use all of the different types of social media. Twitter, for example, is mostly text-based, so unless you're trying to market yourself in the, I don't know, journalism sphere, um, that might not be the best uh, platform for you to be on. If you're not trying to work with other businesses, LinkedIn might not be the best platform for you. Spend some time experimenting, spend some time figuring out what it is you want to do, but as soon as you feel like you're ready, or even before you're ready, it's a good exercise to start this early and then you can tweak and refine it as you go along. Goodness knows we're still tweaking and re refining our offering. But write yourself a business plan and treat it like a business. Don't stop treating it like a hobby. You may have started with filmmaking as a hobby. It's time to start treating it as a business because if you're serious about this and if you want to make this your job, try and put a businessman's hat on. So write yourself a business plan. Write out what your values are, what your goals are, who your target clients are, how you want to help them, what their problems are, and how you can fix those problems for them. Uh, once you've done all of this, it'll start to give you a very clear image of what your brand should be. Um, and that in turn will give other people a very clear image of what your brand is. And then once you have a strong brand, then, you know, that's branding for filmmakers 101. So to summarize what we've said, defining and developing your brand is important because it allows your customers and potential customers to make sense of who you are and to understand who you are. If they're confused from the start, they're not going to really want to hire you. Then we've said be authentic to yourself, play to your strengths, do stuff that you want to do, otherwise you'll have a hard time keeping it up, um, and also pick something that has value, like you don't want to pick something that's never going to make you any money or that no one ever wants to pay for. Then be deliberate. Once you have your plan, once you have, once, once you know what you want to do, plan accordingly. Establish your goal and reverse engineer from there. And then last but not least, be consistent in it. Um, take the time to develop your brand. Take the time to develop the trust with your potential customers. It won't happen at once. So those are just a few of my thoughts on how to brand yourself as a filmmaker. If you did want to talk more, have a conversation about this, um, I would love to. So feel free to reach out to us. Uh, probably the best place to reach us is on Instagram. So at Terralon Media for Terralon and at Julian Wake for myself. Um, you can reach me or any of the team on both of those. Um, that's it. Thanks for watching.